Joining me now is Simon Moores, CEO of Benchmark Minerals. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, yeah, shake hands. Yeah, Sorry. Right. All right. Um, I was thinking about, you know, how to kick off this interview. And um, I figured, you know, if like investors probably love you right now. I hope uh, so. Maybe. I, I think so, based <laughs> on the data. Um, uh, executives of all these mining companies probably love you. It's almost like I'd, I, I could assume them like, just rolling out the red carpet for you. Like, come on in. I don't think you should pay for a stake in Vancouver, man. <laughs> I pay for too many stakes in Vancouver. That's half my, uh, half my own personal problem. But Well, I'm lobbying, lobbying that he, this man should not have to pay for a stake in Vancouver. Um, so your company is basically just has all the, the data to support EV batteries. Yeah. Everything that has to go into the battery. Um, you know, we're going to get into it here. So why don't I start this vehicle, put it in motion, and you kind of start where, uh, how did you get involved in this company? Yeah, no, I love this. This is my first time doing a, a drive time segment, I guess is what you call them. Yeah. Well, that's what I, I, I refer to them as. Um, yeah, a benchmark, you know, we set benchmark up 2015. It's something I've been in this industry since 2006 in this critical mineral space. But, you know, I kind of thought of, well, the need for accurate data on the entire supply chain uh, for lithium ion batteries was where it came from. Covering lithium, covering graphite was kind of kind of the roots of Benchmark and then expanding out to cobalt, manganese, um, nickel, and, th and then learning about the rise of these gigafactories, right? So you start with the mines, everything starts with mining. Um, of course, you have these super-sized battery plants that are being built around the world, and then you kind of fill in the gaps as you go along. And so we just create this unbelievable data machine, which collects price data, it's other supply chain market data, that then the world uses to um, negotiate contracts, um, to to make uh, big investment decisions, uh, and to build out what what we believe is the the kind of this mega trend of our times. Right. So now, have you consulted with governments and world leaders? Yeah, we spend a lot of time um, speaking with governments, um, giving them access to our data. Some pay, some we give teasers for free. Um, but you know, I've spoken to the Senate three times now the US Senate We've spoken to the Canadian government um, governments around the world are part of our subscriber base mm -hmm. so that's I would say that's a big part well it's not it's a growing part of what we do but it's a very strategic part yeah, of what that, we do as well that makes sense um, and mining companies of course would uh, do they pay you for your data yeah subscription based business you know 70% of our revenue is all subscriptions um, so you know you buy it you put it into your workflow it's su such important information that renewal rates are really high. So, you know, people need this. It's not just a case of wanting it. It's a case of actually, okay, we need this price data. We need the supply chain data. And that is the bedrock of our business. How does the data update itself? How, how frequently? Yeah, so um, various cycles. Pricing uh, can be every week uh, or every two weeks or every month. Uh, the supply chain data is at least once a month, but it could be quarterly as well. Um, but I would say between one week and three months. And we have different teams in the division. We have 90 people now and growing to about 120, 130 people this year, of which I would say 70% of that, that number are, are analysts crunching data, collecting it firsthand, qualifying the data, um, and making sure that what we put out is, is the most unique and the most accurate data in the world. Who would be your competitors in this space? Um, well, we don't have any direct competitors in what we do because we're so specialized in, um, in just the lithium-ion battery supply chain. But it could be uh, other people that, that collect data in the space, maybe big companies like Bloomberg. Um, they kind of dabble in, in, what, in what we do on the, maybe on the battery side. You have big mining companies um, like Platts or Wood McKenzie that might do, um, that might do some big commodity data. But the, the whole point of why we've, you know, kind of... Have, have grown so quickly in a seven year period with no investment, no outside money, just organic growth is because, um, because it's not just about mining, it's about, it's about the nuances in the supply chain from getting lithium or graphite or nickel out of the ground all the way through in a battery. Um, it's a speciality commodity and understanding those nuances is really where you, where you get your edge. So now, have you invested in any of these mining companies? Because obviously you see the data, you can see apparently where we are when it comes to needing these uh, critical metal, uh, minerals, mm. uh, metals. And um, you know, it takes a long time to finance and build a mine. Mm. So like there, there's a couple things in what I just said there and you want to sort of 
well, first, do you invest in any of these companies? No, we're not allowed to as well. So, you know, we've got strict, because we're an independent organization. Right. Um, the analysts that collect data, we've got strict policies where you can't invest in the companies that we write and collect data on. So that's that's a, a strict red line. That makes sense. Yep. How bullish are you on this space, obviously? Because you, you, you live and breathe this data, right? So mm. where do you think we are right now as far as the shortage based on where you see the demand curve going? Yeah, so... Right now, we've had seven years, really, since 2015 to now. Is that seven years? Uh, give or take, Not seven years. Off. Yeah, something like that. Um, seven, eight years of, uh, let's say, the, the, the startup phase of this, this lithium-ion electric vehicle revolution. That has put strain on the raw material markets. You've seen it in the lithium price. Um, you've seen the strain on cobalt price, for example. That's really two good metrics to look at for this EV kind of thematic. But where we're going now is from startup to scale up. You know, last year the lithium ion battery industry grew about 40% the output um, to, to just over what we're looking at in and around 700 gigawatt hours, maybe just over. Um, but 40% but growth on that is an industry on top of an industry from what, what we're used to. No, that's fine. Um, so, so, you know, we're getting into a, sta in, into a stage now where even small amount of growth, say 20% on the battery market, is an almighty strain uh, on, the, on these critical mineral supply chains. So really we're going into a phase where um, scaling the, the upstream, the raw material side, is going to be front and center. Because the easy wins of the battery side have kind of been had now. We've got all these gigafactories, but then all, all of a sudden these companies are realizing we haven't got the raw materials to go into it, we haven't got the mines. And that, that kind of fact is now dawning on the industry and it's now dawning on governments as well. How long have you been subscribing to that theory based on the analytics and the data? How long has it been now that you've seen that? Uh, for us since the start, right? I mean, you know, you map out um, just, just one of the, these gigafactories requires, you know, say 25,000 tons of lithium um, or LCE, uh, lithium carbonate equivalent, lithium chemicals, let's say. That's like the size of one mine per year. So actually, when, when, as soon as you're saying, well, there's not just one gigafactory, there's now five, there's now 10. Actually, last year, there was three, over 350 in the pipeline, of which 160 were active. It was only a matter of time before you know, the, the, the chickens were gonna come home to roost without a comparative investment in, in mining that you get in batteries. So we've seen it for some time, but markets always react, they never uh, are proactively um, build stuff out, really. They never proactively get ahead of this. Which is uh, why we see, you know, the huge spikes in certain commodities. Yeah, exactly, because I, I don't know how it come, I mean, I'm not a financial markets guy, right? I'm just an industry guy. And I get a lot of the companies, the financial, sort of, you know, the public companies, and that the, they're actually restricted with how much money they can spend, how far out they can invest. Of course, unless you're a Chinese company, it's a different kettle of fish. And I think that's, that plays a part. Maybe, the, maybe for the big companies, it's worth not building and it's worth picking up cheap assets if, if the markets turn in a down, you know, um, turn negatively in a downturn. Right. I don't know how it works, but it's I've, interesting. Okay, so this might not be a good question for you, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Mm. Um, have you come across any of these large pro producers that have, um, have these assets on their properties that they can sort of go and invest dollars into what they have? Or, or, you know, just restart a mine? Um, not many, actually. The, the big sort of mining companies uh, generally don't have that many sort of, let's say, uh, dormant assets. They can quickly restart. Um, there might be one or two on the books, but certainly not enough to fill the, the supply-demand gap of, of, of what's needed. The, generally, 90% uh, um, of the time, it's coming from... Um, it's coming from the prospectors, the developers um, in Canada and generally in Australia that are actually looking for the mines of tomorrow, that are actually, you know, sticking with developing this mine, these, these projects over 10, 15, 20 years when no one cared about it, when there was no money there for these projects. Yeah. And there still needs to be more, a lot more money for these projects. They're the guys that, um, uh, that are the key to this industry because it's only now that... The, the big corporate mining companies are starting to look at, the, at that side of things. Uh, Vancouver Resource Investment Conference um, that I'm speaking at tomorrow, uh, it's Monday, 11.20. Okay. 
And then we were doing the day after, on the Tuesday, we've got the Benchmark World Tour, uh, Vancouver Lake. So there'll be a, a more specialist um, sort of seminar that, that we're going to do as well on this on this thematic. So w with your keynote, what, like this is going to be put out after the conference. So yeah, yeah. maybe if you can kind of walk us through what your message is going to be there. For me, it's it's always this great raw material disconnect is what we call it. Um, this is that the, you know everyone wants electric vehicles. It's it's nailed on now. We're just arguing about the rate of electric vehicle production uh, rather than the fact it's going to be a mainstream technology, um, which is great news on one side. But actually, it's it's the fact that demand is outpacing this, uh, our ability to respond in uh, in the supply of these critical minerals by about double. So say. Um, Electric vehicles, uh, let's say battery output or EV, EV production, not even adoption, just getting these batteries out into the market, could be anywhere from 30 to 40% a year demand growth, right? It could be 25 to 40%, it's in that region. Um, minerals at best are responding 15% a year. Um, you know, so the, the, the way I view this kind of, this little dot that might be like demand um, over time, it's getting further into the distance. If you're upstream, you're a mining guy, you're standing on the ground here, the little dot of demand and, and reaching that supply-demand parity is getting further and further into the distance. So the talk is really about, you know, how do we speed up bringing new mines and new refining plants, um, you know, into the market in North America and Europe um, and, and to try and solve this conundrum. Um. When you first started, did you have any major mining companies as clients? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And certainly in lithium and, and graphite, like the, our, our clients were, the core of our clients are sort of mining industry. So certainly the exploration development side, they've always been like uh, yeah. the heart of what we do, certainly Absolutely. how it started. Because they would market your data to investors to get to, to, to raise funds. I get that completely. Yeah. And of course, before they even do that, you know, see if it's a good strategy. Um, but major mining companies, the ones that are buying the, uh, yeah. the developmental stories uh, and, and putting the dollars in, were, have they been clients for a long time? Yes, yeah, it's a start. Since the start, the problem is there's a lot more um, on the expression side. There's far more clients because there's, there's yeah. more numbers. On the mining side, they, the, the, the people that are our clients at the start were like speciality lithium companies, like producers, um, battery makers, and a few EV makers that got the supply chain story. That this was like eight years ago. Now, everybody. I mean, it's hard to see. I, I don't even know who doesn't subscribe in terms of the, this, the core of the industry. Um, and big mining companies, like the mining majors, right. who, are, who aren't even in this space really, um, are now absorbing this information for some time. Well, it's fascinating to hear that the mining majors have been uh, you know, paying for your data for, for, what, five years now? Yeah, yeah. Five years? I, yeah. And, yeah, and so, and, but yet we're still, we are where we are, where they're not investing the money that they need to be. Uh, to look down the road. I mean, and, and like you said, you don't know what goes on in those companies and, and why that is. You just know that the analytics are showing you s extreme red flags when it comes to feeding the supply. Exactly. The, in yeah. The mid. Yeah. yeah, 100%. And then the, for me, the interesting ones is I obviously we have a, a system that um, we have a sales system, we have analysts that are constantly, um, uh, let's say, keeping this benchmark machine going. But I, I look out for the companies that. Maybe the ones that aren't quite in the supply chain yet, you know, big iron ore majors that, that don't operate in this space, right. that are buying information, um, governments that maybe left field, you know, governments that are maybe non-mainstream governments that are now looking to get in the space. For me, that stuff is really interesting because yeah. it gives me a strategic insight into what's next. What, yeah, what they're thinking. Awesome. Uh, is there anything that we haven't covered that maybe you, you, you'd want to cover? Um, not really, just, I, I, you know, I, I think after, what, nine years of benchmark, I think 16 years of my career in this, and I'm still young, I promise, it's just, it's just this, the resolution of this is just too high definition now. <laughs> um, uh, 16 odd years of me doing it, like the, crit, the age of critical minerals, that we've always talked about these things, um, is now upon us. Like, uh, it's not just electric vehicle batteries, not just rare earths in, um, in permanent magnets, you know, you're seeing a, certainly with these core, these key technologies of the energy transition, you're seeing the dawn, the real true dawn of, of critical minerals. Um, and I think as a, as a all encompassing story, 
I think that's just really important. The next five years will be will be crucial. Our technology, um, how you know, we need to build big databases, which we're working on. We need to be far more, um, let's say, savvy on delivering via apps on on phones and just making using technology to to unlock the power of the data that we've got. Making it more user friendly. User friendly, um, advanced analytics. We've got so much data. I think clients only see twenty percent of it. Wow. Um, so technology is a big challenge for us, mm. uh, and when you know we're a mining supply chain company, a battery company, we're not yeah. a tech company. So that's that's the be- the biggest thing I think. Okay. Well, I mean that's pretty crazy. If if clients are only getting twenty percent, and they obviously see huge value, um, you know you've got a lot uh, you're leaving on the table. So I um, hopefully that there you know there's some some tech people out there that hear this that go, hey, I want to work with Simon. I need to get involved. I've got some yeah. solutions, whatever. Um, I lo- yeah. yeah. I love that video, actually, of, uh, do you remember the Microsoft launch party? Have you seen that with, like, Steve, uh, not Steve Jobs, it's, um, uh, his predecessor? Or, um, uh, Bill Gates and a few yeah. other guys dancing on stage yeah, and it's Microsoft yeah. Windows 95. Yeah. And the one thing, uh, Steve Ballmer, that was it, he was, he was saying developers, developers, developers. Right. And that's what we need in our business, to, un- to unlock the power of the information we've got. That's our next evolution. Well, there you go, friends. If you think you can, uh, you can help his company out and, un- uh, and unlock more of the value that he has sitting inside and stored, reach out to him. And where can people reach out to you? Oh, um, Twitter, at SD Moores or at Benchmark Min. LinkedIn, uh, love LinkedIn, I'm all over that. And email is info at benchmarkminerals.com. Okay, well, we are now back where we started. Uh, we'd put this in park, shake your hand. Thank you very much. Absolutely, take care.